Ma'am, please join me here po. Our second panelist is from um, the National Economic and Development Authority, Region 12, Mr. Romel Patrick E. Tanghal. He is the Chief Economic Development Specialist of the Policy Formulation and Planning Division of NEDA, Regional Office 12. He finished, he has a Bachelor's of, Art, Bachelor of Arts uh, degree, major in economics, as well as Master in Public Administration degree from Notre Dame University in Cotabato City. He is also a licensed environmental planner and his fields of uh, specialization include development planning, mainstreaming, um, disaster risk reduction, and clim um, climate change adaptation in the planning process, spatial and land use planning, conflict sensitive and peace promoting planning, feasibility, and master plan proposition. Preparation, I mean. Friends, Mr. Romel Patrick Tanghal. Our next panelist is from the Banco Central ng Pilipinas. He is Mr. Cesar Augusto E. Villanueva Jr. of the Center for Learning and Inclusion Advocacy of the BSP. Mr. Villanueva is a bank officer um, and he is actively involved in policy development work and advocacy programs to get more Filipinos to be meaningful participants in the formal financial system. Prior to joining to joining the um, Center for Learning and Inclusion Advocacy, Mr. Villanueva um, is a technical officer with the Office of the Monetary Board, the governing body of the BSP. Friends, Mr. Villanueva. Okay, our next uh, panelist is uh, Dr. Havar e. Pan Shipantao. Uh, the coordinator of the Campus Institute for Peace and Development in Mindanao, um, here in um, MSU Jensan. Dr. Hovar Gal Galiasa Pantao is the coordinator of the Institute of Peace and Development in Mindanao, and through the years, his work revolved around peace building programs such as the ACT for Peace program, the Mindanao Tripartite Youth Corps, the Mangsamoro Youth Initiatives for Development, and the Peace Education Program of Islamic Relief Philippines. Dr. Hobar Pantau, please join us here, please. And last but not the least is Dr. Rek Ikia, uh, who is the Graduate School Dean of the University of Southeastern Philippines. He is a professor um, at the College of Governance, Business and Economics of USEP, and currently, and he is also a Hubert Humphrey Fellow who has a strong advocate for his concept on Eno diversity, which he will dis, um, share with us during uh, the session. Okay, Dr. Rek, he is already here. So we can now proceed to our uh, panel discussion. So we will have, um, compared to the, to the two other sessions, we will have a, um, an interactive session. It's more open, it's informal, uh, similar to a talk show. So, um, as my uh, first, uh, let me just sit. Okay, is there a um, spare microphone? Thank you. Okay. So, as my first question to our panelists, so we have a um, a general question which I would like to throw to all of you, and uh, the question is, how do you? see Mindanao in the era of the new globalization and what risks and opportunities do you perceive for the island of Mindanao and its peoples? Perhaps we can start with uh, the lady, with ARD Flora. Thank you so much. Magandang hapon po sa ating lahat. It's a challenge for us to be uh, here in front of you where you have your snacks. Samantalang kami natitingin sa inyo. Sige. But anyway, uh, I would like to uh, make mention that still the internal risks that beset Mindanao is our security concern. 
Uh, this is a, a long issue on peace and order. And of course, this is being addressed by our leaders since time immemorial. But uh, nevertheless, we are still beset by the same problem, the vicious cycle of struggle for autonomy. With um, its effects on our people, of course, I would like to focus more on the training industry. Uh, we just conducted a BIMP Iaga Forum on Business and Investment Matching last August 28th here in General Santos City. Each of the member countries presented the investment and market opportunities. And it is worth noting that after the activity, we end up as buyers of their products, specifically palm oil, coffee, and rice. These products, we are claiming that we are also producing. We are expecting air and sea routes to be open between and among BIMP member countries. And what I am personally apprehensive about is that it will make us import more than what we can export. Travel more outside of the country to BIMP countries. And ex uh, other than... Res uh, um, but we are receiving more foreign tourists. Uh, no, no, no. Travel more outside than receiving more foreign tourists. Spending more travel money instead of earning tourists money. Okay. okay. Thank you for that candid assessment, ARD Flora. So the, uh, those were the views of our, uh, from the DTI. So may we hear from our friend from the BSP? So how do you see um, Mindanao in this uh, new era, of, in this era of the new globalization? What opportunities and risks do you see? Well, um, as uh, being part of the BSP, um, of course, the things that uh, we normally notice would be the level of uh, transactions and how financial transactions are being conducted. And uh, since uh, the Philippines, including Mindanao, has a large or very high um, phone penetration rate. So, meaning this is uh, both for the basic phones and the, the smartphones. This high penetration rate is an opportunity to tap into global markets. And uh, it is also an opportunity to harness the growing and expanding um, globalization of fintechs. Okay. As you have noticed, there are, um, there are uh, fintechs coming from other countries that are already uh, breaking ground and doing small uh, increments of business here in the Philippines and uh, this is an opportunity that uh, uh, people in Mindanao can uh, tap into. Thank you. So, Dr. Pantao, uh, please. Yes, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Greetings of peace to everyone. With that question, I see Mindanao in the era of new globalization as a community which exerts efforts to cope with urbanization where increasing migration of people from rural to urban er areas is evident. Because of urbanization, people in Mindanao may be pushed to consider converting the farmlands into subdivisions and industrial areas, which I think would threat food security and biodiversity sustainability. This is also the era where people increasingly embrace sedentary lifestyles as they invest more time to digital platforms where identity and cultural challenges are of left and right dominance. Mindanaoans also contribute and utilize influx of information which are at times more contradictory rather than harmonious. In the discourse of globalization, cultural dimension is the most fragile and delicate and I see this as a risk for Mindanaoan because it is a home to many cultural communities. Historically, Mindanaoans have been challenged by introduction of cultures brought about by colonizers, and I believe it is indispensable to discuss culture here. 
Let us take note that a long history of conflict in Mindanao is also a struggle for self-determination and a struggle of self-identity. As time goes by, our culture has grown up with distortion and a Mindanaoan child grows with some confusion in celebrating its unique identity and this wide gap may be exacerbated by globalization. The global space is actually calling the Mindanao citizens to migrate from conventional to global village and is threatening the preservation of culture and identity as changes may not be conducive to peaceful coexistence of multitude of actors in Mindanao. So our friend, um, our friend from the NEDA mentioned about um, the opportunity that he saw. Sorry, our friend from the BSP mentioned about the opportunity that he saw uh, from technology, no? So, and how it can uh, possibly uh, spread uh, fintech technologies which can promote um, financial inclusion. However, Dr. Pantao, on the other hand, mentioned how technology, remember, um, Secretary, uh, our Minda chairperson this morning mentioned about technology being a double-edged sword. So yung nakikitang double-edged sword ni, ni Dr. Pantawa no? on how technology can be um, a driver naman um, for, um, you know. It, it may be a boon or a bane. A, a boon or a bane. But I also acknowledge globalization as a driver to ecom economic prosperity, mm -hmm. increased tolerance of diversity, and in interconnectedness if if it is used properly. However, there is a vulnerability that gaps may exist if culture and ecological, ecological aspects, aspects may not be balanced. Great, okay. Um, Dr. Rec, your thoughts please? Is it working? Good afternoon, Twitch, and everyone. I'd like to outline my scenarios into three parts. The first part on, uh, on the issue of inequality as a consequence of new or globalization. New globalization or globalization. Uh, second, on uh, the, the, the new trend of leadership on how do we address the fourth industrial revolution as a driver of globalization, and that is on, and the third one was how the rule of the university on how do we address the, uh, the welfare ignorance in the internet age. The first one is on, yep, the first one actually is on, on the inequality. Inequality categorized into two uh, parts. There are two types of inequality. First is on the inequality, on spatial inequality. In the context of Mindanao, you have noticed the haves and the have-nots. There are regions that are left behind, uh, regions who are rich in mineral resources, but uh, with high poverty incidence. So there's a need actually to address the issue of the Dutch disease on the crisis of abundance or the crisis of uh, I mean the resource enclave. Second, on the, spas on the social inequality. Social inequality because the uh, a bigger percentage of population is in the base of the pyramid. The challenge now is how do we uh, take advantage or maximize the benefits of globalization by developing a business models that our people at the grassroots levels can, can, can participate in the global production value chain. And the third one, of course, uh, is the, for all of this actually, I think there is a need for a genuine collaboration, complementation, and convergence. Because I have noticed that we have actually initiatives on convergence, collaborations, and convergence, but the challenge on how do we translate this into tangible results. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rick. And finally, from our representative from NEDA. Good afternoon to each and everyone. Allow me to thank uh, PIDS and me for allowing us to participate in this forum. I'm representing my regional director, Teresita Socorro Ramos. I would like to take off from the dif different uh, perspective of the four uh, panelists. Uh, as the regional director, Gabunales mentioned that security still persists as a problem and a challenge for Mindanao. And we concur with that. Uh, as mentioned by the uh, speaker from, from the participant from the PIEP, how do you address security 
for Mindanao because as uh, monitored or assessed by our uh, security sector agencies, still security persists. The problem of the negative uh, consequence of the security in the, in, the, in the island is a challenge. But as laid down, the president, through his Philippine Development Plan, has allocated or made its part as a bedrock strategy ensuring security, public order, and safety, not only for the country, but the entire island. That is why he pushed the passage of the uh, RA 10154, or the Bangsamoro Organic Law, to address uh, some security issues. And hopefully, some uh, sectors, particularly the violent extremists, will come, will join the mainstream, so that extremism, especially those coming home from abroad, will be addressed. On the part of the uh, penetration through the technology, one of the challenges there, sir, is there are still areas in different areas of Mindanao which is not covered by the uh, cellular mobile technology system. This uh, high penetration rate is found in the urban areas, but integrating the island of Mindanao through digital infrastructure is still a challenge because the geographically isolated areas still do not have uh, CMTS signal. So ito po ay challenge para sa ating mga telcos to invest tower so that our far flung communities, the people there can participate and be integrated. On the aspect of balancing technology and culture, sir. One of the chapters of our Philippine de Development Plan, including its regional development plans in the six regions of Mindanao, is a chapter devoted to promoting culture so that uh, we will be able to uh, champion, advocate, as what architect, uh, the previous uh, speaker has mentioned, looking at the culture and preserving our heritage so, uh, towards social cohesion. So the PDP of the Duterte administration is trying and initiating to integrate all aspects from social, political, economic, and even the environmental aspect, ma'am. Thank you very much. So very valuable inputs from our panelists um, in terms of the risks as well as the opportunities that they see in the era of the new globalization. Now, let's go to the specific question. So, um, of course, each of you is uh, representing a particular sector or a particular group, and we would like to hear your uh, particular response to, to the question assigned to you. So, for, for um, ARD uh, Laura, ma'am, no, kasi one of the features as, um, rep as presented this morning by Dr. Briones, one of the things that we can see as far as trade and industry is concerned is the growing, is the uh, mga trade tension, ano, which in the case, for example, of the U.S. and, uh, and China has already is escalated into a trade war. No? So, um, as, for example, the Philippines, no, it's, 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 um, have, it's integrated in the global value chain. It may be affected in one way or another. But analysts are pointing that um, it may be um, beneficial for, for some countries like the Philippines and other countries in the ASEAN because it may result in uh, what is called as trade uh, redirection. No? So, for example, the tariff-affected countries no, may, may go to the Philippines instead no? for for yung mga goods and services na mga na kailangan nila. So, in the case po of Mindanao, um, what particular effect or impact do you see will the trade war uh, pose for, for the region? Is it, do you see it as a parang, does it pose a, a major concern for Mindanao? And um, dun sa aspeto po ng trade re redirection, how can we um how can we attract more investments into the island 
not just into the region into region 12 but in in into the island as a whole you know okay so thank you so much by the way before uh, you will wonder ano nga ba itong us and china war i just would like to say to say that us and china are locked in a bitter trade battle over the past year the world's two largest economies have imposed tariffs on billions of dollars worth of one another's good goods u.s president donald trump has long accused china of unfair trading practices and of course violations in intellectual property rights for us it is an opportunity to be able to access the biggest export markets and foreign direct investors that we have in the past and that is both US and China. Sila naman talaga yung malaking investors natin and pinakamalaking market natin. And however, na kung titingnan natin as mentioned earlier sa mga previous talks, we got to have a ready business sector to meet the challenges where we can compete. What government can do is to provide the right environment for them to be able to do business and be competitive. For the Department of Trade and Industry, of course, no, alam na natin na kami yung primary coordinative and promotive, promotive and facilitative regula and regulatory arm of the government for the country's trade, industry, and investment activities. So dalawa ang role ng DTI, that is championing business and, of course, empowering consumers. We would like to, to get most of the imports that we have by way of protecting also our consumers. But we would like our business sector to take advantage naman doon sa export opportunities natin. In as far as investments in Region 12, in 2017, we have uh, gathered 12 projects with 14.887 billion worth of investments, while in 2016, we had 16 projects and 9.5 billion worth of investments. These projects in 2017 are broken down into manufacturing, that's 509.42 million worth. In energy, ito yung pinakamataas, that's uh, 12.147 billion. Real estate development, 1.469 billion. Support to agriculture and fishery, 110. And agribusiness, 650. It is worth noting na similar yung mga investment requirements ng ating BIMP member countries. In terms of Philippine Economic Zone Authority that are operating in Region 12, as of November 2017, there are manufacturing ego zones, that's Jensen Economic Zone, that's 50 million worth of investment. We have an IT park, the Mabuhay IT Park, worth 47 million. We also have Agri Industrial Eco Zone. And uh, it is worth noting that PESA registered firms are processing facilities that produce products exclusively for exports. So, kasali na dito yung pineapple market natin, pineapple exports, as well as tuna and other projects natin. For our export performance, it is also worth noting na nag-increase rin tayo, no? From a negative growth of negative 3.44%, uh, when we compare 2013 vis-a-vis -vis 2014, and we increased that one with 10.11% when we compared 2015 versus 2016 and 14.69% 2016 to 2017 in terms of volume and there is also a corresponding growth in terms of value. What DTI is doing, hindi lang sa Region 12, kung hindi sa buong Pilipinas, is we do expert promotion and development. We have several programs to address this concern and 
we are conducting uh, doing business in free trade areas orientation so that our business sector, our exporters and would-be exporters know what are the tariffs requirements and saan tayo pepe di take advantage in as far as these free trade agreements is concerned. Specific to BIMP Iaga, kasi dito talaga nakaka-focus ang Mindanao, it is worth noting also that napakaganda ng infrastructure natin ngayon. Uh, we have good roads. In fact, most in Region 12 are moving towards uh, four, six lanes, that's National Highway, and that's ASEAN standards. For our trade, we have regional, national, and international fairs that are conducted regularly. And now, we are focusing on e-commerce. The prime directive as of today is to promote the growth of e-commerce, nurture MSME's participation in the digital economy, and ensure that consumers are protected. For DTI, it is trabajo, negocio, and consumers. But we must take note that in e-commerce, trust between buyers and sellers is fundamental. So maganda na yung medyo nag-usap-usap tayo, especially with BIMP Iaga countries, dahil ibig sabihin, nagkaintindihan po tayo in as far as quality and volume of products is concerned. Further to develop our MSMEs, we are having industry clustering enhancement programs and DTI-12 has priority clusters also. National clusters include bamboo, coffee, cacao, cocoa choir, processed fruits and nuts, rubber, palm oil, wearables, and home styles. However, for the region, we focused on our uh, competitive advantage in terms of production of mascobado sugar, tuna, processed aquamarine, and ICT. DTI also involved itself into road construction through our Roll It project, that's roads leveraging linkages to industry and trade. So all proposed road projects must connect or lead to a national road or provincial or local road that is in good condition. Because we would like our agribusiness industry to also take advantage of better roads in transporting their products, whether raw materials or processed, to the markets. Paano na lang yung ating produkto kung pagdating doon sa market, lamog-lamog na. Diba? So we've got to have very good roads. Hindi lang po farm-to-market roads na hindi makakaya ng mga uh, big trucks. So ngayon, DTI is there already in the countryside, linking our production areas to our processing facilities. Of course, for the local uh, businessmen, we also would like to provide business-enabling environment through several projects to include CMCI, ito yung Cities and Municipalities Competitiveness Index. Ito palagi yung pinagyayabang ng ating mga LGUs kung ano na yung rating nila because it will mean that their LGU is competitive. We also would like to streamline business permits and licensing system and also we collaborate with the ILG para ma-implement natin ito properly. However, in 2018, lahat tayo dito is involved, kasali tayo dito sa implementation ng RA 11032, the ease of doing business and efficient government service delivery act of 2018. So there are some provisions, hindi lang po related doon sa business licenses and permits, but also related rin sa pag-deliver natin ng ating government services. So, other than those activities, we have some SME development programs and projects, and now we have negotiation centers in all of the municipalities and cities in Region 12. 
So 100% na po tayo in as far as uh, establishment of negotiation center is concerned. So what are our people doing in the negotiation centers? Of course, we provide MSMEs with the business advisory services tailored according to their needs. So hindi lang ito porque may training, lahat na lang may gusto mag-attend. Purposive yung intervention na binibigay natin sa kanila. Foremost also, it is the business registration assistance where we facilitate processing and documentation of requirements for the establishment of MSMEs. Ito lagi yung reklamo ng ating businessmen. Mahirap kumuha ng lisensya. But mind you, our negotio centers is providing this business registration assistance. We also provide business info and advocacy by conducting trainings, seminars, and dialogues to increase MSME's productivity and efficiency. And finally, we also have financing facilitation. Saan ito nakastipulate doon sa RA nine, number 9501 that's Magna Carta for micro, small, and medium enterprises where there is already a mandatory allocation of credit resources to micro, small, and medium enterprises. Baka ito later on ma-provide na info ng ating taga-BSP. So with that, ito po yung presentation ng DTI. And I am speaking also in behalf of my RD, that's RD Doris De Lima. Thank you so much. Thank you, ARD uh, Flora, no, for sharing with us the programs and initiatives of, of the DTI. No? So, malaki yung maitutulong ng mga programa ninyo ano, to make um, Region 12 and also other parts of Mindanao uh, to become a, an environment conducive to investments talaga. Yes, of course. No? Parang binabawi ko lang sinabi ko kanina na apprehension na hindi tayo makakompete. So, meron tayong answer doon sa mga apprehension, hindi lang po ng taga-DTI, kung hindi pati ng ating business sector. Yes, that's right. So, kasi the government cannot do it alone, of course. We need yes. the help of the private sector, the business sector, the academe, uh, civil society, kaya nga multi-sectoral ang approach natin. Ano, ma'am? Yes, po. Yes, okay. My next question is for uh, Mr. Villanueva of the BSP. Kasi kanina, uh, in a session two, our um, resource speaker from the Oxfam gave us some uh, statistics uh, on uh, status of financial inclusion sa Mindanao. No? And she mentioned specifically for BARM, no? so about 91% of the people in, in BARM um, still do not have access to mga financial services. So, and um, we all know na how important financial um, inclusiveness is um, in, in terms of um, reducing poverty, reducing inequality. Um, and I would like to ask kung ano po yung ginagawa ng BSP kasi financial inclusion is one of your flagship programs. And um, a welcome development actually is the uh, signing of the uh, Islamic banking law, no? which will, um, which aims really to make, um, you know, the people, which aims to promote financial inclusion here in Mindanao, especially for those, for our Muslim brothers and sisters who do not, you know, use conventional means, no? conventional banking facilities um, because of their faith, no? So, could you please um, tell us uh, good news from uh, the BSP in terms of prog uh, programs and initiatives in so far as promoting financial inclusion is concerned? Okay, so, um, to aid in my uh, uh, presentation of uh, the initiatives and strategies of the BSP, I have a number of slides prepared. Sure, no and uh, please indulge me if some of the figures or the graphics have already been shown earlier by a, our friend from uh, Oxfam since uh, we're also revolving around the same space. So um, to kick off the presentation, uh, next slide, please. Yeah. as uh, mentioned earlier, um, 
financial inclusion is defined as the state wherein there is effective access to a wide range of products and services by all. So, the operative uh, uh, aspects of this that we monitor are access and usage. Why? Because it is possible that a financial service or product may be accessible, but it is not designed properly or is not beneficial to most people, therefore, it remains unused. On the other hand, there might be a financial product or services that may be very, very beneficial. However, very few people have access to it. Therefore, it doesn't really bring in financial inclusion. It doesn't drive their welfare. And as mentioned uh, by uh, Dr. Sheila, um, who are the unserved and underserved? Um, these include those who are underserved or unserved due to religious barriers. So those who cannot avail of the conventional uh, um, credit products that are uh, being offered in the market nowadays. So, and in addition, those are uh, the MSMEs, small farmers, fisher folk, those in the low income population and uh, the rural areas. So here's the spatial map and uh, the indicators that we try to, uh, to follow. So access and usage and uh, roughly one third of our population, uh, of our uh, cities and municipalities are still unbanked, but I have good news later down the presentation. And as for usage, 48% of uh, adults have savings. However, 7 out of 10 do their savings at home. And 23% uh, of adults have formal bank accounts. So that's a figure that we are trying to, to achieve, uh, to, uh, to increase. And financial literacy, something that is very, very important However, three out of seven questions relating to financial literacy, uh, that's the rate of uh, the correct answers of the Filipino adults. So you can see babagsak yung financial literacy. So when we ask the people what were the factors why they didn't have an account, 69% said that they had insufficient funds. 53% said that the uh, costs are too expensive. Then there's also the lack of identification and uh, physical distance. And uh, there is also a lack of trust in the formal financial institutions. So given this premise, 17 government agencies which compose the uh, National Financial Inclusion Steering Committee, which is empowered by an executive order, um, coordinate and carry out the national strategy for financial inclusion. So what is this strategy? It's a four-point strategy that is based on four pillars. The first pillar is financial inclusive policies and products. So come up with a lot of policies that will enable the creation and the existence of uh, financially inclusive uh, products and services. Then second would be strong consumer protection and, consumer edu uh, and financial education so that it would bolster the trust in the formal financial system and they have a redress mechanism in case there are problems against financial institutions. The third is advocacy, where we bring in more awareness towards uh, uh, projects pertaining to financial inclusion. And the last is data and measurement. 
so that we would be weaned away from the use of anecdotal information and uh, shift our policy making towards um, evidence based uh, uh, methods. Next, please. Next, please. So, uh, one of the products that uh, we believe that would drive financial inclusion would be microfinance. And microfinance meaning it is not just microcredit, but also microinsurance, microinvestments, and other related products. Next, please. Okay. So in 2017, um, the Financial Inclusion Steering Committee um, identified two priority areas and it also considered the condition of a lot of our uh, brothers in Mindanao. So the priority areas are agri and MSME finance and the second is digital finance. So. Why Agri and uh, MSME? Next slide, please. Well, for one, um, the amount of people that are employed. So uh, for Agri, there are uh, 10.3 million people employed. As for MSME, 4.9 million are employed. Then 80% uh, of the poorest rely on Agri and uh, Despite being the main source of income for the majority of Filipinos, Agri allocates only 8.5% of the GDP. As for MSMEs, uh, they comprise 99.6% of total businesses and account for 61.6% of employment. However, its GDP contribution is only around 40%. So, uh, when we check why this uh, low access, next slide please. It was identified, uh, uh, back lang. Yeah. due to cost, credit his lack of credit history, contention, or the perception that the lower income segments cannot pay for their credit, lack of collateral, and uh, lack of channels. Next slide. So uh, to address these uh, constraints, microfinance was uh, uh, mainstreamed as an innovative product to the unbanked and the underserved. Then credit enhancements were provided through the credit surety fund. So the credit surety fund is uh, present in uh, 56 LGUs right now. And uh, maybe a third of them or a fourth of them are located here in Mindanao. Then. Um, there's the weaning away from the focus of lenders towards collateral, and instead we are uh, shifting their attention towards uh, cash flows and, uh, and their ability to pay. Then um, finance, innovative financing models such as agri-value chain financing is also being uh, espoused. And uh, we are also espousing the cost efficiencies through digitalization. And uh, underlying support would be through credit guarantees, crop insurance, movable collateral and warehouse receipts, credit information, and the national ID. Next slide, please. So as for digital finance, uh, th we believe that digital finance is a good strategy in uh, promoting financial inclusion and uh, it brings about cost efficiencies and it transcends natural boundaries. Next slide. So uh, we have a very good uh, or ripe demographic for digital financial adoption. Next slide. And uh, we have a three-pronged three approach. This is the democratization of a basic transaction account, 
expansion of the low-cost touch points, and the natural, uh, an efficient retail payment system. So why are we focusing on a transactional account? A transactional account is not just a store of value. Once a person, ha person has a transactional account, meaning either a bank account or an e-money account, this enables the person to withdraw, deposit, pay his bills, place investments, avail of uh, micro-insurance, and uh, a whole lot of other financial services by having an account. So the account is your ticket to financial inclusion. So that is why we are trying to democratize access to a, uh, a transaction account. Low-cost touch points. These are uh, touch points that give convenience to the public or the account holders. So the, uh, the account holders, uh, transaction account won't be that much of a value if it cannot be used anywhere and anytime at his convenience. So by expanding the low-cost touch points, we have uh, enabled uh, the neighborhood 7-Elevens, oh, convenience stores, uh, water refilling stations, pawn shops, pharmacies to become uh, agents of banks to uh, facilitate the cashing in and the cashing out of these transaction accounts. Then the national, uh, the efficient uh, retail payment system is an interoperable retail payment system under the national uh, retail payment system. So we ha already have two uh, automated clearing houses, Instapay and PesoNet. So Instapay is for low value transactions, giving uh, real time uh, real time fund transfers. Well, PesoNet is uh, a replacement for uh, the use of physical checks. Next, next slide, please. So uh, these are the per uh, particular uh, uh, circulars that we released regarding these uh, transaction accounts, cash agents, and uh, national retail payment system. Next slide. So uh, in terms of effects, um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, be through the circular on cash agents, we now have 8,000 cash agents all over the country, and we only have 104 LGUs that remain unserved. So, ibig sabihin, six, uh, 90, 93 to 94 percent of our LGUs now have at least one financial touch point. And uh, other issuances and developments include um, uh, regulations on pawn shops, virtual currencies, risk-based KYC, guidelines on uh, info management and privacy. And uh, we heavily support the National ID, the Personal Property Security Act, wherein movable collaterals can be used as collateral in borrowings and uh, the Payment Systems Act, which governs the National Retail Payment System Administration. And uh, we're also uh, assisting in the drafting of the Financial Consumer Protection Act. So uh, I still have two minutes left, so. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, um, can we uh, just go back to uh, the uh, four slides back? Uh, forward, 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 forward. Uh, yeah. So uh, basically, um, this is the strategy that we're uh, going to employ to drive financial inclusion. And uh, we believe that a lot of the low-hanging fruit can be uh, can already be uh, tapped through this approach, providing people with a transactional account and uh, letting them use them through the expanded low-cost touch points and facilitate the efficient uh, electronic transfer of funds between accounts, which is interoperable, meaning I'm having uh, an account with Bank A, I can transfer my account my funds to bank B. I don't need to have my recipient open 
uh, bank account in bank A as well. So, yon interoperable. So, by having those three core components, we believe that we can drive up financial inclusion double its level within three years because uh, the demographics, the infra, and uh, the awareness is already there. So we're coordinating with the various government agencies and the private sector for uh, adoption of uh, the transaction accounts and uh, to build on the digital ecosystem. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, DSP. No? So our next question is for our uh, friend from Daneda. No? So all of us naman here are familiar with the uh, ambition, ambition natin 2040. It's important guide for us, for Filipinos, because it represents a, the, the long-term vision for the country of uh, matatag, maginhawa, at uh, mapayapa. Panatag na buhay para sa ating lahat. Okay. Um, sir, um, considering the yung mga risks, ng mga, at mga challenges under the new globalization, do you see any aspect of the ambition that should, should be prioritized? And uh, in relation to the PDP, the Philippine Development Plan, and the Regional Development Plan for, well, for Region 12, um, may mga updates ba kayo na nakikita na dapat ding i-prioritize para mas maging responsive tayo dito sa new globalization? Yes, ma'am, uh, Dr. Sheila. Uh, if uh, some f uh, members of the audience, of the participants, uh, have no idea how, how the ambition natin came into being, no? So I would last like to provide some background, ma'am. Yeah, brief background lang po. Sometime in 2015, during the administration of President uh, Benigno Aquino the uh, third, NEDA initiated a nationwide survey uh, asking Filipinos uh, ano po ba ang kanilang gustong uh, makita ano ang vision nila by the year 2040. So, it was 2015 or 25 years from 2015. So, it's ambition in 2040. And uh, it was participated in by about 10,000 respondents across the country. And uh, lumabas po doon Majority of the Filipinos, about 79 to 80 percent, wanted a simple and comfortable life. How do you translate simple and comfortable? No? Matatag, maginhawa, at panatag na buhay para sa lahat. Ito lamang po ay yung uh, sa divided into three segments. No? Simple and comfortable. Meron silang uh, pang-araw-araw na panggasto may pamamahay sila na sarili, may isang sasakyan, makapagtapos ang kanilang anak sa kolehiyo, merong enough na savings para sa emergency na pangangailangan, makapagpasyal dito or sa abroad, and to spend quality time with their friends and their families. Yun po ang gusto ng 80% ng Filipinos based on that survey. And, uh, Providing integrity or uh, support for that nationwide survey was a, an advisory group coming from the private sector and the academy. So from there, uh, it ended sometime in 2016 yung pagkandak ng survey and coming up with the results. And during the assumption of President Rodrigo, Rodrigo Duterte, he signed Executive Order Number 5, adapting and approving ambition natin 2040 as the long-term vision of the country. Um, and B, the big letter V, vision. So, it's like an ambition sa English, but translated to A-M capital B. So, vision, a vision for the next 25 years. Simple and comfortable life, panatag, maginhawa, panatag, uh, maginhawang buhay. So, uh, ito po dapat ang magiging direction ng mga programa ng pamahalaan. Sana rin, and joining the private sector, civil society organizations, the academe, to join government in 
providing the opportunities for all of us Filipinos to reach our ambition by 2040. Maginhawa, panatag na buhay. So, uh, the Philippine Development Plan of President Duterte is the first plan towards ambition natin 2040. Meron pang tatlong administration bago natin marating yun. That is why the goal of the Philippine Development Plan is to lay down the foundation for inclusive growth, a high-trust society, and a competitive knowledge economy. So yun po ang ating goal. That's why President Duterte, through Executive Order 27, signed sometime in 2017, issued this directive to all government agencies from the national up to the barangay level na makiisa. Lahat ng ating efforts ay directed towards the goal of 2022 so that it will be the groundwork towards ambition in 2040. Fortunately, in our, I would just like to mention, in the regional development plan of the Soxargen region, one of the priority legislative agenda is to craft, for Congress to craft a law which will make ambition in 2040 as a law. No? Craft a bill so that it will become a law na ito ay magiging batas na. Hindi lamang siya executive order dahil itong EO5 kapag may papasok na bagong pangulo, pwede niyang palitan. However, if it's a law, mas mahirap i-repeal na magiging gabay natin. For example, Japan and China, they have a 50-year long-term vision which is, which is enacted by their parliament and uh, the People's Congress. And starting from Region 12, we would like our congresspersons and senators to enact a bill para mapirmahan po sana ng Pangulo in the next three years. For example, for Mindanao, ano po yung uh, pwede nating makikita sa PDP? In Chapter 3, which is the National Spatial Strategy, there is a Spatial Strategy for Luzon, Visayas, and Mindanao. What do you see for Mindanao? Mindanao is envisioned to be a safe, peaceful, resilient area wherein concern ni uh, Dr. Pantau and uh, Dr. Egua, yung peaceful but wherein the diverse culture will live harmoniously so that Mindanao will become the agri-industrial center of the country based on its resources. No? Agri-industrial and resource-based economy. That is why to achieve our vision for Mindanao, uh, Director Gabonales mentioned connectivity, not only physical. Our uh, friend from uh, BSP mentioned digital. No? Kailangan physically integrating Mindanao through connectivity of roads. Dr. Pantao mentioned people from the rural areas pumupunta na sila sa urban areas para maghanap ng trabaho. Iniiwanan nila yung rural areas. But this is the concept of the National Spatial Strategy of Regional Agglomeration and Concentration. I know Dr. Roel Briones also mentioned this kanina. Regional Agglomeration, Connectivity, and Vulnerability Reduction. That is why we envision Mindanao to be resilient no? as an island region. And one of the foundations of the PDP framework is ensuring peace and security. That is why we hope that the passage of the BOL will trigger and we will reap the dividends of this peace agreement. And also the President has issued way back in December 2018 and all of us are called to follow this and comply. Ending local communist armed conflict through EO70. Building and ending communist, the 50-year communist insurgency so that our geographically 
isolated, disadvantaged areas or the jidas and conflict-affected communities will be transformed into peaceful, vibrant, economically active communities. Coupled with this, one of the bedrock foundation is building, accelerating the build-up of strategic infrastructure. Pinakita sa atin ni ASEC Montenegro kanina na ang leverage ng Mindanao is BIMP Iaga to justify to the national government why build airport, why build railroad system, why build roads, bridges para po mabigay sa atin yung resources. And this is part of our showcase. Mindanao is a showcase to by MP Iaga. Making resilient our people, our community from natural disasters and human-induced disasters. And lastly, because we envision Mindanao as resource-based economy, no? it's agri-industrial and resource-based economy. We hope that our environment will be sustained, no? maintaining the integrity of our environment. Dahil dito po, nagre-rely ang production ng ating raw materials. For uh, the objective of uh, DTI of manufacturing, saan mang nagaling po ang raw materials? It's based on the resources that we have. Di ba? Mindanao, the land of promise, because of its resources. So yun ma'am, ang nakikita namin. The President, through his Philippine Development Plan and the six regional development plans has laid down the groundwork for transition and the implementation of change towards ambition natin 2040 and at the same time inclusive growth ibig sabihin leaving no one behind lahat po tayo ay sama-sama two prong approach achieving our commitment to the sustainable development goals of the united nations leaving no one behind Zero hunger, zero poverty by year 2030 and beyond. Thank you very much, Mr. Tanghal. Our uh, penultimate um, question is for um, our friend from uh, MSU Jensen. No? Sa ating uh, representative from the Campus Institute for Peace and Development in Mindanao. Um, let us go back to the um, critical issue of uh, the weakening of uh, social cohesion, which we have attributed to a number of Factors you mentioned, uh, technology can also drive uh, the weakening of social cohesion. We can also attribute it to the worsening inequality, no? Even to um, um, the proliferation of fake news and disinformation, even to the prevalence of corruption. Na nagiging dahilan kaya yung mga tao ay uh, nawawala ng tiwala at uh, pati na rin yung pagkawatak watak ng uh, ng mga tao. So, sir. Um, Itong mga ito can can further exacerbate no the existing situation in Mindanao no so in your in your opinion how can Mindanao achieve a long lasting peace and development uh, considering na etong ating era of new globalization mas ano characterized siya by yung sinasabi nga kaninang umaga na buka no mas volatile mas complex siya mas ambiguous mas uncertain yes first of all I am a living evidence that, so, that social co cohesion exists in Mindanao and in Visayas because my mother is an Ilonggo from Capiz and my father is from Maguindanao, uh, Cotabato Empire, who is a Maguindanaoan. And uh, they live with peaceful coexistence despite diversity. But um, even if there is a coexistence among the people in the community, there has to be a very good political platform that people can feel in the community. I believe that the social cohesion and the issues that are related to social cohesion is coming from mutually reinforcing factors. May it be manifest or latent, but these are actually mutually reinforcing each other. But I'd like to start with a political aspect. I believe that um, the problem on peace and development in Mindanao, uh, the, the, the issue on the new era of globalization may be solved 
if good governance is served and felt not only by the people at the top, but also felt by the people on the ground or at the bottom. I also believe that these issues exist because the Philippines, whether we accept it or not, is still on, at the age of infancy in as far as democracy is concerned. And people are supposed to be the most empowered in the democratic government, but I think in today's generation, in today's era, the people are the least empowered. To cope with this, there has to be strong courts for systems of checks and balance, vertically and, and horizontally, where everyone takes responsibility without being threatened. And even if everyone is critical and empowered, people always take the pathways to social cohesion. Apparently, the issues on new era of globalization is exacerbated by the advent of technology, as what I mentioned a while ago. And this advent of technology is paving way to the birth of new forms of social cohesion online. We can ground this phenom phenomenon to the theory of Darkham, where the morality and loyalty bonds per headed people's adjustment and adaptation to the emerging needs of society. Technology now is becoming very influential to the extent that people have to, the tendency to sacrifice the common good to conform to the new social norms. Sabi nga nila, OA ka kapag hindi ka magkoconform. Right? Consequently, resulting to influx of disinformation that is considerably, what? Unraveling ignorance, distrust, hatred, and violence among the people. To deep dive, I would like to quote the statement of former Secretary of Education, Brother Armin Luistro. He said, truth is nice, but what for? What for if the community does not accept the truth? Because we tend to support what is popular. What for if we are part of this damaging and corrosive architecture of this information? What for if we patronize, applaud, and value the morally damaging statements of the powerful people in the public square? What for if truth is swayed by the tides to amplify, uh, amplify lies? These statements, I think, are very timely for everyone to reflect on, especially in this era where proliferation of information disorder is on board. The online architecture has been motivating the people to use the likes at the as the metric of careless approval without, careful, without being careful and cautious. They are not critical about it. All they need to do is to click even if the information is a form of disinformation. Whether we like it or not, the online social interaction discourages meaningful conversation among the people and it nevertheless encourages shallowness. Nagkiklik ka na lang, hindi mo pa naiintindihan kung ano yung nasa post. At times, the online public square is crowded by cheap words and narratives that feature the badness of people. And this is saddening. I believe that trust is fundamental in the implementation of needed reforms in this new era of globalization. And part of building this trust is a commitment to positive messaging. There is this urgency for everyone to turn these bad narratives into positive messages where everyone's milieu is not an emissary to profanities. Everyone should endeavor positive messaging both in online and public square, offline public squares. There is a need to turn the messages we broadcast to messages of hope, trust, and conviction. We tend to be negative with our messages, even online, even offline. And I think it's time for us to share stories of hope, share stories of angels rather than stories of ghosts. Along this line, there is also a need for us to build alternative media platforms to safeguard social cohesion from the exploitation of various vehicles of disinformation. Another possible action to eradicate disinformation is to create mechanism for fact-checking. This alternative action reminds me of the concept presented by my co-fellow from a uh, fellows from Myanmar in our Southeast Asian Fellowship on Critical Thinking, which focus on the development of fact-checking devices. Their concept can be replicated along with educating the people 
to be vigilant, to be vigilant with uh, what they are seeing and what they are reading as online propaganda and content of online media. There has to be spaces for people to maximize the power of digital hygiene and critical thinking. Moreover, on the side of the academe, being considered as the most immune place for this corrosive and damaging disinformation, academe has to lead the way. As a ministry of thinking, of design thinking, and thinking critically and co-creatively, it is our responsibility to take action. The academe may endeavor to stop the traditional branding and perception of people that academe is an ivory tower and people can hardly reach it. I believe that it's time for the academe to go to the ground and initiate programs that transcend to the heart, to the, to the heart and encourage inclusivity. Technocratization is far behind going to the reality in terms of making a difference. I am working in the academe and I also one of the people who, were, uh, who, who was on the roads of Mindanao and I saw and I felt the plight of people from that uh, diverse groups of people in Mindanao. We have to go to the ground and work with the humanity. Other than multidisciplinary, which is emphasized in our research forums or fora, this era requires us to be transdisciplinary. Transcending to the heart is far better than logic. Let us remember that behavior change is the ultimate goal of education. In a more concrete sense, I think academe, along with private sector, government, and other agencies, should create platforms and public spaces for face-to-face -face interaction like this. In the spirit of dialogue, Mindanao State University General Santo City, for example, through the Institute of Peace and Development in Mindanao, anchors its programs and activities on the word Paminao. It's a Bisaya word, which means uh, probably a triple meaning. It could uh, mean listening, it could mean perspective or people's perspective, and it could also mean feelings. It attacks the three domains of learning in the, space or in the context of education. I think that the new era of globalization has pathways that complicate the social fabric with lies as the anchor. Secretary Luisto and the president of Ateneo de Malina, Manila University emphasized in a final discussion that truth is simple, lies are complicated. And I should say, lies pave the way for disinformation. Let us remember that truth is a simple thing and life is just complicated by lies. I hope someday I can just easily click the thumbs up on the social media without, without thinking so much, not because we're not critical, but because we're certain that the people have developed the culture of delivering the truth. Daghang salamat. Thank you very much, Dr. Pantao. Well said. No? I think halos lahat tayo may ganung ano. May ganung desire na someday, no, hindi tayo matatakot. No, kasi nasa tao, meron tayong value nung lahat tayo, may value nung information literacy at talagang katotohanan lang yung sineshare natin. Okay, for our um, last question, um, and this is of course for uh, uh, our graduate school dean from USEP. Sir, um, sa lahat ng ito, what do you see is the role of the academe? So, in terms of um, one of the features no, of the new globalization, the um, rise of the advent of technologies, no, which we know naman is, uh, can, can empower or it can, can also make the lives of uh, people uh, worse na, no, if, for, for those who cannot access technology, for companies or for small industries na walang access sa technology. So, in terms of promoting innovation, ano po kaya yung role ng academe as well as for um, um, also fostering social cohesion and other, um, and other, and other chat, in, and in addressing other challenges that go with the new globalization? Thank you for that question, ma'am. I'd like to uh, to guide with our discourse on the impact of new globalization, I'd like, based on my experience and based on the uh, lessons that I've learned from those universities that I was given also to the opportunity to engage with in the United States and also in, among those 
uh, universities in the ASEAN. And also with my experience teaching in the teaching, doing research in the university. Uh, you think of a university, there are three models. You have the academic model, the economic based model, and the strategic agenda of the university. Uh, let me squarely discuss or unpack this that would lead us to reflect and rethink the need for us to revisit the model of the university because it is really a mismatch of the new that we are talking on the new globalization. Uh, first on the academic model. Uh, for us academicians here uh, and researchers, when you think about the academic model, we are referring to uh, areas like curriculum. Now, on the, on, the, on the aspect of curriculum design and development, it seems that there is a need for us to reflect how university design or develop curriculum. Uh, in my experience and in my experience and observations, our curric the manner of how we design our graduate program curriculum, for instance, based on my experience, uh, was based on the was anchored on the imprisonment or based on the imprisonment of historical practices. Uh, the current crisis on the curriculum development of universities is not basically on the external forces, but on the imprisonment of the university on the historical practices of ownership of the subject, ownership of the program, uh, turf, fishing among, turf, turf fishing among colleges, uh, to a certain extent that we compromise uh, the value, the new value proposition that we can supposedly uh, design a curriculum by maximizing multidisciplinary expertise. But have you noticed in the university, we have a curriculum owned and run uh, fragmentedly by a certain college alone. That's curriculum de development. And uh, it is, not, second, a curriculum that is not responsive to the industry needs. We offer graduate programs that doesn't uh, respond to the needs in Mindanao, for instance, we, lack, uh, we have this build, build, build projects, but we have a scarcity in terms of engineers in transportation engineering and uh, other field of engineering and geology and so forth and so on. So where do we get our engineers? So I think there is a need actually to reflect and revisit our model in the design of the curriculum. Second, on the issue of pedagogy, we talk about uh, globalization, but have the cons the, the yung sinasabi natin global, globalization, we have this industry for 1.0, 2.0, 3.0, and fourth industrial revolution. But the pedagogical, in, the pedagogy or andragogy of teaching, both undergrad and graduate pro programs, are obsolete. Why it is obsolete? Because we challenge our students to cultivate the habit of a critical mind. However, the manner we deliver our teaching strategy or methodology in the class is obsolete. It's reporting, it is a professor-led discussion or it is a student-led discussion. We have not even tried an experiential or case method of teaching and so forth and so on. So that's pedagogical innovation. Now on the issue of the post-truth or the so-called, the post-truth or the so-called the willful ignorance of the internet, of the internet, the age of the internet, uh, you've noticed actually our students, we are supposed to use the digital technology as a platform for intellectual discourse, for this as an avenue for us to discuss on, uh, on to discuss on, uh, to address on the issue of, 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 of obfuscation of facts and the challenging, for example, on evidence-based policy discussion. But we've noticed our digital technology actually are used actually for uh, fake news. Uh, disinformation, and even it is being uh, supposedly the professor is supposed to take the initiative as an ambassador of scientific based discussion, but the professor is taking the lead of fake news or disinformation. So that's something uh, we need to educate not only the students on the post truth. Post truth is the word uh, defined in the Oxford Dictionaries in 2016. Uh, it refers to relating to uh, relating to uh, circumstances where uh, where objective facts are less influential than 
emotions and feelings or ideology that I will not discuss this detail for that, but I think we need to re we need to revisit our pedagogical innovation of teaching and learning. The third, on research and development, research, development, and technology management. For research, development, and technology management, I have introduced in the university the innovation initiative, or the so-called Innoversity, innovation initiative in the university. But I think uh, it really requires a lot it requires efforts, actually. It is very difficult, difficult or a challenge when you introduce innovation if the bottleneck is at the top of the bottle. You know what I'm saying? Meaning, right now we have research and development and technology transfer. You assist, you have to conduct an inventory of your technologies uh, developed out of research and how many of these technologies translated into technology that are commercialized. Seldom you can find universities that they were able to graduate technologies for commercialization because the performance matrix of universities like state universities and colleges is limited only up to the number of patents and the number of licensing. We don't have actually the, you look at how many startups, how many spin-ins or spin-offs on technologies out of research because basically, our definition of innovation is too limiting up to licensing and patenting and copyright. Supposedly, our innovation, definition for innovation should start with, you have, the, you have the research, like for example, the basic research. You have the proof of concept. You have the proof of product, and that is the prototype. And you have actually the startup, where you have to develop the business model licensing agreement and so forth and so on. Then you have the scaling up or the mass productions of the technology. We define our innovation up to the level of generation of new idea, but it has no impact. We fail to translate the idea into a technology ready for dissemination or for commercialization. We are trapped by the so-called valley of death. The, the literature used to describe that as the valley of death. Valley of death meaning we failed actually to graduate our technology from prototypes into commercial technology. So in the other countries, their definition of innovation is that innovation is equal to invention or new idea times commercialization. If you cannot commercialize your technology, your innovation, that's not, if you cannot commercialize your idea, then that is not innovation. If you cannot create impact with your new idea, that is not innovation. Our innovation is only up to the level of Technology transfer. <laughs> the te technology transfer. I'll tell you just the technology diffusion, but there was no diffusion basically. Now, I'd like also to discuss on the collaboration. Universities, we have MOUs, we have MOAs, uh, Memorandum of Understanding, because the performance indicator is the number of MOUs and the number of Memorandum of Agreements, because if you have more MOAs and if you have more MOUs, then you have actually fulfilled uh, the, the requirement of issues in labeling and so forth and so on. But this translation, this actually, these collaborations are not translated into tangible results. When you challenge the university or the academy, for example, how many percent of the poverty incidents in your region that your research contributed in reducing such poverty incidents? That's impact. Or maybe you might ask the question of how many percent of the uh, industry growth where you have this comparative advantage of that industry that the university contributed in terms of the growth of the industry through research, through technology. Hirap, medyo mahirap ata. Or maybe a question na lang siguro is that how many percent of the social injustices, like for example, social industry, how do we address social injustices and environmental integrity? We talk about social injustice, environmental integrity, cooperative economy, and so forth and so on. But how, we, how do we translate this into a performance matrix for the university to be accountable on their research, instruction, extension, and governance? So that's technology. We need to, we need to have these genuine collaborations with the industry. It's genuine collaborations with. But the question is that if I am now from the industry, what's in it in your university? You have nothing to offer except your dominance 
of the instructions with your high with your high polluting words and that's the reason why industry do not like to work with the university because you have an intimidating jargon and so forth and so on uh, even the local government units you ask university how many resolutions ordinances resolutions ordinances and even uh, programs and projects were uh, designed approved developed and approved by the local government units as a consequence of the research of the university, even local government units. Number of resolutions and ordinances. Now what's the relevance, if you question the relevance of that university, the relevance of that graduate school? A, there's, a big, there's a challenge on the part of the university that the university has to open its door. There's a need to op the, the university to, op to open its door by collaborating, having a genuine collaborations with the local government units, with the industry. Me, for instance, if I would ask actually from the university, what is the value proposition of your center, of your research? If in the industry, they will only collaborate, of course, it's a win-win. What's in it in your university? The university has nothing to offer a new business model, a value proposition. What needs of the industry that the university can address? What are those, uh, do you have the multiple knowledge bases that we can uh, maximize for us to address the problem of uh, infrastructure and so forth and so on with the agricultural development, for example? Not, that's the question that we need to review how the university is, is being run. The university is supposed to create the future, not to create the history, recreate the history rather. The reason why, because the universities, for instance, and even other professional institutions, we've been doing the same things all over again in the same way, and, and we expect a different results. And that is according to Albert Einstein, that's insanity. But if you do some deviation, if you introduce innovations in the university, it's really a challenge. Why? Because innovation is deviating from the norms. And when you, are, when you deviate from the norms, or excellence is achieved by deviating from the norms. If you are alone in the university advocating, from the, advocating on deviating from the norms, you will be wrestling actually with those people who are actually committed to the status quo. Hirap, hirap. Mahirap yun. So that's one thing. I'd like to end my, my talk on... Uh, the performance met uh, the, the, the university a uh, performance matrix performance matrix of diversity we have the spms um, and so forth and so on but those are indicators actually that are not reflective of the realities in the industry the realities of the uh, the government uh, are supposed to be the stakeholders working with us in the university like just like sir sabi ni sir kanina we have the university have a has a big role in terms of achieving the ambition 2040, uh, translating the Philippine development, the medium term Philippine development plan. But the question is that the research agenda of the university, are they aligned to the knowledge gap of the PDP? Are they aligned to the knowledge gaps of the, the ambition 2040? It seems that there is a disconnect in terms of the research and development agenda of the universities where basically it is imperative to harmonize the research agenda of the universities, work on those areas that create impact, contributes to the knowledge gaps of the PDP, and the knowledge gaps of the, P of the Ambition 2040. And lastly, innovation is in the university requires uh, to cultivate the entrepreneurial ecosystem. You've heard many times about transforming the university into an entrepreneurial entity. That is easier said than done. Why? Because here, cultivating the so-called the culture of innovation suggests or implies the need for a cultural shift. A cultural shift in the sense of the way of life of the professors the need to cultivate a partnership, collaborations with the industry, getting out from the comfort zone in the university. And very important is that 
that culture of innovation and entrepreneurial ecosystem. The reason why, uh, do we have, have you heard about venture capitalist angel investors? Uh, do we have our own definition of angel investor and venture capitalist here? Who are they in our local context? Now, when you talk about globalization, in the United States, actually, you have an area of venture capitalists. And this area of venture capitalists working with innovation lab, innovation laboratories, and incubators in the university. But we don't have, we need, actually, we have the Startup Act right now. But I think uh, to create an enabling environment of cultivating an entrepreneurial ecosystem, first thing is that we need to educate we need to spread entrepreneurial education to leaders in the university. Entrepreneurial education. Because uneven executive education for universities. Why? Uh, you have noticed this is the only institution that you don't have actually executive education for being the dean, for being the vice president, for being the president. You will be designated as dean of the college or director or vice president, even you don't have the formal training on executive education. So it's a learning by doing, it takes, the learning curve actually takes time for you actually to become an executive leader because when you are designated, that's the time actually that you have to start learning. Yeah. Thank you very much. Salamat po. Thank you very much, Dr. Ikiyam. Unfortunately, uh, we don't have any more time left for um, an open uh, forum. So, um, uh, just one reaction, sir. Uh, that is why I would like to share with the group that the Philippine Development Plan will be assessed later. And based on the uh, explanation of uh, Dr. Egua, all of us agencies within the government should already translate from output monitoring to results-based monitoring. Not on the number of MOA signed, MOU signed, but on the outcome where we contribute, do we really have impacted on reducing poverty? So yun po yung programa natin na sama-sama and our ultimate goal is to eradicate poverty. So ganun na, Doctor, sa, sa inyong contribution sa SUC, where do you contribute? In uh, increasing uh, literacy rate, parang ganun, or uh, improving the mismatch from the graduates of the university to the requirements of the industry. Okay. Yes. Thank you very much, sir. No? So um, please join me in thanking our distinguished uh, panelists for their thought-provoking remarks and presentations. No? So we hope that our session has uh, um, open in our eyes, open your eyes, that globalization, the new globalization is not to be feared. Rather, we hope that our session has motivated you, has encouraged you of the importance of working together because it is by working together that we can um, uh, navigate this new globalization um, effectively. And as we have um, seen in this panel, everyone has a role to play, the government, the private sector, the academe, the civil society, so that all of us can make this new, new globalization work to our advantage. Marami pong salamat. Thank you very much. So now may I call um, in behalf of Mindanao State University, Dr. Edna, and in behalf of Minda, Director Ray Tan, to award the Certificate of Appreciation to our, um, to our panelists. Okay, another round of applause, please, to our panelists. Thank you very much, Sir Ma'am, our friends, um, for your insights and contributions. Thank you. So, um, a reminder to our Muslim brothers and sisters, if you would like to 
um, do your 6 p.m. sambayang. The prayer, you, uh, prayer room at the College of Law is available for you. So, uh, also to those who have not given their survey forms yet, kindly submit it to our facilitators and secretariats in exchange of your certificate of appearance. Thank you very much. Um, I will not take you away any minute longer from your families and loved ones, so may I call to officially close the program the president of uh, PEDS, Dr. Celia Reyes. So, ito, hindi ho five minutes lang. <laughs> so, on behalf of the Philippine Institute for Development Studies, let me extend my gratitude to the Mindanao Development Authority Chairperson, Secretary Emmanuel Pinol, Mindanao State University Jensen Chancellor, Dr. Anshari P. Ali, and Mindanao Authority Assistant Secretary Romeo Montenegro, as well as to our distinguished speakers, colleagues, and representatives from the government, academe, and civil society. Um, pleasant good afternoon to all of you. Also, let me thank the MSU for preparing such a beautiful venue and in showcasing the Mindanaoans culture through the performance of the university's Kab Papagaria Ensemble and its choral group this morning. Indeed, Mindanao has a lot to offer to both local and international visitors. Ang galing, nakaka-proud uh, maging Filipino. In fact, yet last night when the, we first saw this, we were so impressed. Um, at lalo kaming na-impressed nung nakita namin yung um, musical group. Um, I'd also like to take this opportunity to thank Minda, which has been our partner for five years now. Uh, we look forward to co-organizing next year's Mindanao Policy Research Forum with you. Sana ganito din kaganda yung venue at ka-supportive and active ang ating magiging local uh, partner. Oh, and of course, I'd also like to thank... Um, I'd also like... Sabi ko nga, tumaas yung peg namin for holding um, conferences. So I'd also like to thank our um, research information department led by Dr. Sheila Siar and ably assisted by Wang... Gwen, JM, and of course our senior research fellow, Dr. Roel Briones, for organizing this forum with Minda and MSU Jensen to make sure that we share our policy studies uh, with the people who matter, you. Um, I'm very pleased to note that today's forum has been very productive and engaging. After listening to the presentations of our speakers and insights of our local audience, I'm glad to say that we were able to cover a wide range of topics. We started the day by looking at the bigger picture through the presentation of the concept of the new globalization and its intricacies. We were also able to pinpoint its possible impacts not only to the Philippines but also to Mindanao. But more importantly, we were able to identify local actions that can help the region address problems that may come along with the new globalization. Uh, we discussed various local topics from making sure that the region's agricultural lands are utilized and protected to capitalizing on Mindanao's trade relations with other ASEAN countries to harnessing new technologies for more inclusive um, um, financial service for the Mindanaoans and of course ensuring that cultures are preserved amid the, this new globalization. Uh, but we should not stop here. It's important that we follow through on what we have accomplished today. In fact, that's what some of you are clamoring. The suggestions and insights that have come up from the discussions must be translated into actions in order to benefit everyone in the region. But then again, the government cannot do it alone. We need all the support and cooperation we can get from all the sectors. Uh, we hope that through this forum, we will all go back to our offices and homes with an understanding that this new phase of globalization does not only bring challenges, but opportunities as well. Our collective goal is to make the new globalization work to our advantage 
and lead to inclusive growth, thereby reducing poverty and inequality. Again, thank you very much for coming and good afternoon. Let's all spread the good news that there are local actions that we can do to navigate the uncertain waters of globalization. Salamat po. Thank you, Dr. Celia. So that is it for our forum today. To our friends who flew all the way here in Jensen, to our organizers, facilitators, guests, we look forward to working with you more in the future. Maayong um, gabi and daghang salamat. Before we finally head home, let us all have a photo opportunity. Uh, while, we are all, while we are all still here, uh, let us have photos taken here on stage. Uh, may I request the university officials of MSU, facilitators from Minda and PEDS, our panelists, speakers, discussants, and uh, university presidents. Let us all gather here in front, Bob. Thank you.